Oh, it's you again, you lonely cross-eyed half-bred old couch suckers. Hi, my name is Nigel Shitfist, and this is Steph Starfish. Pack it up, Steph. And welcome to the garden of earthly delights that is vids. The video review program that sticks its oily fist into the bubbling miasma of new releases and pulls out the very best for your delicatation over the next seven days. This week we've got Crime Capers, Risk Takers, Alien Investigation, Anal Penetration, Pam Greer and Saddled Thespes in Rubber Suits. Steph, this appeared through a tear in a space-time continuum, folded space, and there it was in my lap. I was, uh, at, at that moment, standing on the deck of the radar van. It was nighttime, and uh, I was looking up in the sky because there were saucers up there. Were there any alien bodies recovered? No bodies. There were four live, feeling good guys. Four live extraterrestrials? Four alive, feeling good, extraterrestrial type individuals, yeah. Journalist Bruce Burgess is in search of answers. Have aliens landed on the planet? And are our governments covering it all up? So he heads off to the now world famous top secret military installation, which just happens to be the size of Switzerland. Set on a remote dry lake bed 80 miles outside Las Vegas, Area 51 is just one part of the massive Nellis Air Force Base. This is an area that has been known, but officially denied for many decades. Uh, uh, we go back uh, quite a ways into the 40s and 50s with the development of the U-2 spy plane, the SR-71. All of our super secret aircraft uh, have been developed and test flown out in this particular area. Bruce talks to ex-employees, scientists, and a guy named Travis Walton, whose own abduction story was made into the film Fire in the Sky. We're given facts and figures, government film footage, and computer simulations of the base, where apparently scientists have been back engineering alien technology for years. And one 74-year-old tells of his 16 years of working side by side with an actual alien called J-Rod. I would have a question, uh, you know, and, and I would bring it up in my mind, I just how I wanted to present it with him, and he'd already know that I had this question, and he would already have the answer for me. And if he responded, it would be in my voice. And you wouldn't even open your lips. Area 51 is basically a rip-off of the X-Files from dramatic music, moody lighting, and teletext-style newsprint. In fact, fans of the Arse Files will already be familiar with some of the terms employed here, like Black Ops, for instance, which is a secretly funded covert operations unit which attempts to subvert third world countries by selling them dirt-cheap copies of Miami Vice. In 1989, one man blew the lid. His name was Bob Lazar, and he claimed to have worked back engineering recovered alien spacecraft. The bus drove up and we stopped there, and clear as day in the hangar, taking up almost all the hangar was the disc. Uh, looked like something right out of a science fiction movie. And we stopped, got out, and for the first time I was let in through that door. It was obviously made uh, to be piloted by something smaller than the average human being. There's lots and lots of talk about gravitational propulsion systems and time distortion theory, all propagated by arch conspiracy nuts who thinks that aliens have permeated the very fabric of society and occupy key positions of authority. Now, we know this is absolute bollocks. The only aliens you're likely to see is down the U-Bend, stuck there, unflushable floating obstacles, if you know what I mean. This is the Avro car, which was launched in total secrecy in 1955 less than 10 years after alien saucers were allegedly recovered from Roswell, New Mexico. Why was the military test flying saucer-shaped flying craft in the 1950s, when Project Blue Book denied they existed? Was it a cover to hide the real alien saucers being tested out at Area 51? There's no doubt there's something going on at Area 51, and this is a decent enough little documentary. The truth may be out there, but there's bugger all proof in here. The lack of truth is out there to buy now. Ah!
Up next, the marvellous Palookaville. Nigel. <laughs> Unemployed in skin, Russ, Jerry and Sid, played by Vincent Gallo, Adam Trees and William Forsyth, are in need of a get-rich-quick scheme. Turning to crime, they fail miserably, one time breaking into a baker's instead of the planned jewellers and only coming away with the till contents and a few pastries. Look, we should just forget theft completely, just rule it out, concentrate on ideas. I'm not talking about a life of crime. I'm talking about a momentary shift in lifestyles, a little itty bitty alteration. You understand? You understand? You're in a hurry, you go on the highway, every fucking car on the highway is going 80 miles an hour. What do you do, Jerry? What do you do, Jerry? Do you drive 55 because it's the law? Of course not. You go with the flow. You drive at the prevailing speed. When you exit the highway, then you revert. What's this? $45, we got the cash register. Oh, we scored. Yeah, we scored. There, big shot. Go buy a donut. Palookaville's got a sort of cool, smooth European feel about it and some great snappy dialogue. And it's got a sort of light feel, so you can tell that nothing too heavy is going to happen to the principal characters. Old, steady-faced Vincent Gallo is OK as the sort of deranged dreamer who's dying to get away from his pissy life in a pissy town. And you can tell he's also dying to get away and direct and write and star in his own film which he does so in Buffalo 66. He thinks he's a young Dennis Hopper, but in fact, he's just a young Vincent Gallo. All right, in order to isolate the driver, the truck's got to break down. Now, we attack the gas line. We drill a hole in the line while the truck's parked in the parking lot. There's no night watchman. And then we plug up the hole. And when the driver takes off the next day to pick up the cash, we pull the plug and follow him. The truck runs out of gas, we're right there. Well, what if he runs out of gas in front of a police station? We decide when we run out of gas. How fast he's traveling and how fast it leaks out. Exactly. Our best bet's probably right about here. Something's not right. But this is completely doable. Gas is combustible. One spark from the drill. One day, the solution to all their problems appears before them. The local security service is dodgily run and would make easy pickings. So they start plotting their caper. This is hugely enjoyable stuff with Gallo's problem family and William Forsyth's love for his dogs stand out. On the gas. Oh, look at this. Oh, it's just the front panel. What's the big deal? Are you going to take care of it? Was Shut I driving, up. Jerry? Shut up. You know what my deductible is? Shut up. Anyone hurt? Why the hell did you put on your brakes? I was overheating. So I put on the brakes. Jesus, you guys come out of nowhere. What you wearing masks for? Because we're going to rob you, asshole. Palookaville is slow-paced comedy drama brought to you by Uberto Pasolini, who produced the full Monty, out to buy from the 24th. And now for the wonderfully titled... I was a Doctor Who monster. is presented by the seventh and worst doctor, Sylvester McCoy, who introduces us to those men and women who have played and suffered as creatures throughout the decades. And then they go on to bore us to tears with their tales of what must be the highlights of their career as playing Cybermen, Fishmen and Daleks. And it's pish. Without Grandfather, we'll never find our way out of here. There's only one thing for it. We'll have to split up and look for him. We mustn't do that. He told us to stay here. Anything could have happened to him. He could be hurt. Here we are, back in the 1960s, when program making was very different. Although it was recorded on videotape, there was virtually no editing. So the programs had to be acted out from beginning to end. 
just like in a play. You can imagine the pressures. I was a Doctor Who monster is excruciatingly cheaply made. It's basically a bunch of old lovies banging on about character exposition and motivation. Although why they would need that, because basically they run around in carpets for costumes for God's sake. It features co-presenter Ace. Remember Ace? Yes. Well, she's a bit of a TARDIS these days, I must say. And it wasn't made by the BBC, but it was made by Real Time Productions, who make Doctor Who spin-offs about Yetis. They don't feature the Doctor, but they feature the Brigadier. Hmm, enough said. We never knew who was in charge, whether it was props or whether it was the uh, people who... Wardlow, that's it. And sometimes we would be left in the Daleks whilst, whilst everybody went to uh, dinner. And we struggled to get the tops off, and we just couldn't do it. Because when we uh, asked people afterwards, the props would say it's wardrobe, and the wardrobe would say it was props. I like Doctor Who. I mean, Tom Baker was the master, no pun intended. I actually met him once and he gave me a jelly baby. But this video sucks big time. There's no footage from the series, there's only dodgy stills and a really crap reenactment of Doctor Who style footage running throughout it. Please? Is there anyone there? The only saving grace was the story of the stuntman who basically gets the stunts wrong the first time because he's paid per take. Clever bastard. You'd have to be a seriously fanatic Doctor who file to want to get this. I was a Doctor Who monster, out to buy now. Come back in part two for a bit of this. And a bit of this. And welcome back, you soggy brain, slowed up synaptic response rate. Up next, our favourite part, the contractually obliged gratuitous tits and arse. Only this week, we've got gratuitous T and A and D. Check this out! Also out this week, we've got three new movies about gay relationships. First up is Leather Jacket Love Story. 18-year-old Kyle, a Patrick Swayze lookalike, is bored with his lifestyle in the west of Hollywood and heads off for inspiration, which he finds at a pathetic poetry cafe, where he also meets and falls in love with an older guy, macho biker, called Mike. And look out for the cafe owner, because it's Mink Stole from John Waters' Pink Flamingos. Hey, Blondie, you! Hi, can I help you? Okay. Um... Well, I'd like to get um, a lemon tea, an ice smoker for myself, with a short head on it. Oh, this is a short head. Oh, I remember you from this morning. A small head. You mean like a pinhead? Well, honey, for you, it's one pinhead special. Leather Jacket Love Story tries to be both comic and a deep, insightful look into the world of gay culture, but seems to fail on both counts, mainly due to Kyle's pathetic lack of characterization and his reluctance to allow Mike's little predilection for handcuffs at bedtime. Hi, <sighs> oh, It's a problem, huh? I know it's like it's so boring. Boring? <sighs> We've only had sex once before. If you're bored, Mike, then, then you're the one with the problem. Leather Jacket has some great unintentionally bad dancing, a truly terrible stripper, and some gay bashers who are camper than Quentin Crisp. I guess this is a fucking faggot neighborhood after all. Yeah, it looks like a cocksucker to me. Kiss my gay ass, you shit. <laughs> oh. Shut up, you faggot! <laughs> Hey, guys! What the fuck is this? Well, what are you doing out here walking alone? Beat it! Oh. <laughs> Should I call the cops? The police? 
They won't do any good. These assholes don't like even odds. Who the fuck are you? We're the neighborhood watch patrol, jerk. Go, now. What makes me sick is looking at your ugly face. Right. Oh, 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 oh. Next is Naked Highway, a kind of MTV-style porno movie with a thumping soundtrack and plenty of thumping flesh. Nigel. Naked Highway, lovers on the run movie. Mm-mm. How could I know that you break my heart so? Colorado goes on the road looking for his lost love, Billy Joe, who's become embroiled in the gay porn industry. Eventually, Colorado meets up with an on-the-run murdering hustler played by Joey Violence, and they embark on a Thelma and Louise-style hunt for long-lost love, Billy Joe. Naked Highway is an arty fuckfest, but at least the guys are good-looking, unlike hetero porn, where all the guys look like their faces are stuck on upside down, and they've got 16 chins and 19 beer bellies. And finally, some prefer cake. A low-budget first feature from Heidi Arneson about Kira, a non-funny comic who spends her time going from partner to partner, while her food-fixated straight pal Sydney worries about her insecurity. Well, listen to the incredible meal I just had. Okay, I started with warm herb goat cheese and sun-dried tomato. I said me. Over-educated, underachieving, neurotic, clipped conversations, too self-conscious, too self-aware, but actually not a bad film at all with some good cameos and a good supporting cast. Best ways to get to know someone is seeing how they eat sushi. You'll know immediately who has good taste and who doesn't. Well, like whoever orders a combination plate, you'll know is boring and definitely cheap. But whoever orders a lot of different rolls has got to be interesting. Are you ready to order? I am. I'll have the combination plate number seven, please. Oh, and could I have that on a separate check? I'll have the uh, giant clitoral oozing with roe, and I'll need a warm washcloth, please. Sorry, we don't have clitoral. Oh, you're all out? Oh, that's too bad. Um, then I'll just have what she's having. Yeah, that's a good one. Overall, Some Prefer Cake is a pleasant little comedy drama about love, relationships, and chocolate cake. It has a great psycho stalker who won't take no for an answer, but the best moment has to be the flashback to the disastrous blind date. <laughs> Leather Jacket Love Story, Some Prefer Cake, and Naked Highway are out. Now. I don't think a great deal of this carpet licking, Steph.
Next up, we've got a couple of snow movies, and we're not talking about the old Peruvian marching powder. No, 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 no. First of all, we've got Snow Riders 2, a festival of lunacy for ski bums everywhere. It was a box office smash in America, and now it's available for us. When you go for big air, make sure your brain bucket is always full. Powder snow, that's another story. Oops. Now, if I was trying to do this, I'd probably bail out about now. Snow Riders 2 is corporate style infotainment. Or is that edutainment? No, I think you'll find it's irritainment with a virtual reality bad boy telling you not to fast forward at the start. But you jolly well have to because there's about 12 minutes of promotional guff before you get into the real nitty gritty of this. It doesn't know whether it's MTV or National Geographic. And if you took away the Snow Riders' favourite adjective, awesome, they'd be truly fucked. Still, they do go down some pretty radical slopes on bikes, skis, skateboards. Hey, anything they can find, even a couch. Rock this town, rock it inside out! And Klaus Obermeyer's chasing them with a 25 pound, 35 millimeter camera. Better. It couldn't be better. Well, it couldn't be better. It couldn't be better. Yeah. better. Snow Riders 2 is well worth the watch, but it'll appeal more to the extreme sports fans. Also out this week, Free Radicals. Almost identical to Snow Riders 2, Free Radicals is shorter and it doesn't have any commentary. It once again shows you the more extreme sides of skiing and snowboarding, and it really goes to show that you shouldn't ski down a mountain that you have to take a helicopter ride to get to the top of. Yeah. Radicals is something of a paradox between the nihilist style of the German punk bands who provide the soundtrack and the privileged lifestyle of the skiers involved in the making of the film. Still, it's better than Snow Riders 2, and some of the slopes are truly awesome, man. Free Radicals is well put together and full of crazy people, but it's only half an hour long. And if you want to break a few bones yourself, keep watching the credits because they give you contact numbers for all the slopes keyed, but they're not for the faint-hearted. Free Radicals and Snow Riders 2 are out to buy now. Love is like a never-ending melody. Look out, it's the end of the show and we've had enough, but it's competition time, so if you would like to see some more, Yes, we've got this charming suede, I think the collective noun is, a sputum of ski videos to give away to the lucky, lucky personage who can answer this one simplistic question. Go on, Steph. Name the Bond film in which our intrepid hero flees to safety on his makeshift snowboard. We'll pull the answers from our massively sweating, engorged hold all. Answers by fax only on 0141 353 666. Oh, now, James, let me tell you how I escaped from some evil guys in Sardinia. They draped crepe paper over me, and I ate my own arm to escape from the weight of the crepe paper. <laughs> that's nothing. I escaped inside a used condom down a Bulgarian sewage system. Well, that's very good, very good. You can escape your way out of a wet paper. I escaped once by crawling up my own anus, and I disappeared in a puff of nothingness. That's because you, you are your own anus, you sad bastard.